The president. Government bill. This council continues with the second reading debate on the appropriation bill 2023. Members already spoke at the last meeting. I now call upon the relevant secretaries to speak first, and then I will call upon the financial secretary to reply. Secretary for Development. First of all, I thank members for their invaluable views expressed during the debate on the Appropriation Bill 2023 on matters relating to the Development Bureau, in particular on land development and the development of the construction industry. The Chief Executive has recently emphasized that we must, we must catch up with time, results and prospects. We must look to the future for land creation and development. There must be adequate land for policies to be formulated to improve livelihood and work environment and to develop industries where we enjoy an advantage so as to enhance our competitiveness. According to the 2030 plus towards a planning vision and strategy published in October 2021, we estimate that over the 30 year period between 2019 and 2048, the overall demand for land is about 6,200 hectares. We need to increase land supply to meet this demand. Among others, 3,000 hectares will come from the northern metropolis and 1,000 hectares will come from Khao Yichao artificial islands. These two projects, therefore, will play a pivotal role in land supply. As we earlier indicated, the supply of spade-ready sites will reach 3,280 hectares in the, com in the coming 10 years. And during the same period of time, the northern metropolis and Khao Yi Chao artificial islands will contribute about half of the above. Land creation requires multiple prongs. We'll consider various land sources and different initiatives. For example, there are about 1,600 hectares of land in the new territories, over 1,000 hectares of which, and 60% of them being brownfield sites, will gradually be developed into high-rise residential buildings and other uses to enhance land use efficiency. In the coming five years, we will resume about 500 hectares of private land. However, these are sites with existing users. Replanning and development will have, have an impact on landowners and users. Based on our experience and what we have, we still need to proactively make new land through strategic reclamation to further bolster the government's active role in land supply. Some people have questioned the need for both the northern metropolis and Khao Yi Chao artificial islands, given the local population is on the decline. I would like to make three points. First, when compiling population projections, the, stance, the Census and Statistics Department has prepared a higher population projection scenario for reference. With social and economic development, the population in Hong Kong may grow to a level closer to the higher scenario. The number of households which affects housing demand is also expected to rise as families become smaller. We must be prepared and not focus on a single projection scenario when it comes to land supply. Point number two, we must not base our planning on population and household projections. We must also plan with a vision to improve people's living space, for homes to be bigger and more comfortable so as to meet the public's aspiration for a more spacious living environment. And an aging population will mean a higher demand for living space and design. For example, flats will have to be bigger to be elderly friendly. More outdoor and indoor facilities will have to be provided for the elderly to age in place. In addition, social progress means a higher demand for more and better public services, such as healthcare and welfare. 
we will have to raise the supply targets for various GIC and public open space sites in order to enhance the quality of living. Point number three, at the same time, we're facing the challenge of aging buildings. Despite the Urban Renewal Authority's effort to expedite the renewal of old districts and private developers' efforts in redevelopment projects, we're still unable to catch up with the rate of building deterioration. It is imminent that we speed up urban new renewal. Creating new land can help us meet public demand by providing decanting space to support the chain of movements, thereby creating a favorable condition for rehabilitation. In other words, the government can drive policy innovation with sufficient land supply. Of course, apart from supplying homes, the northern metropolis and Kaui Chao artificial islands are vital in promoting economic development and integrating into the country's development plan. Their strengths lie in their respective locations. The northern metropolis is situated in Hong Kong North. It is close to Zhenzhen's urban core and in and innovative industrial base where the growth impetus is, is conveniently located near seven land boundary control points. Kaui Shao Islands are placed in a strategic spot eastwards. They are connected to Kowloon West. To the south, they can be connected to Central Core Business District. With a 20-minute journey, they are connected to the northern metropolis, Tianhai and Zhenzhen. And eastward, uh, westwards, they are connected to the Hong Kong International Airport and Hong Kong Zhuhai Macau Bridge, which provide connectivity to the mainland. The journey time is similar. The, the Kao Yi Chao artificial islands have the capacity to be the third CBD and an, an extension of the harbor metropolis. If we miss out, Hong Kong and our next generation will lose this golden opportunity. The government is proceeding in full speed these two mega projects. Let me explain the details. The various land development projects in the northern metropolis are proceeding at different stages. The NDA projects in Kotong North, Fanning North, Hong Shui Kyo Hachin, and Yunnong South are under construction stage. The Suntin Technopole and New Territories North New Town project are under planning stage. We will soon commence consultation on the development proposal and planning layout of the Santin Technopole, the flagship INT project in the region. We are making preparations for the establishment of the Northern Metropolis Coordination Office to provide steer and coordination. I urge members to support the establishment proposal to create new posts. The government plans to commence the statutory procedures for the EIA of the artificial islands and the connecting strategic roads within this year. This will be followed by a detailed design and site investigation in 2024. Our target is to commence reclamation in the end of 2025 for the commissioning of the roads connecting the artificial islands with Hong Kong Island West and Northeast Lantau in 2033, when the first batch of residential development can start its intake at the same time. We will also strive for the commissioning of the railway line before major intake. Once the detailed design stage begins for these mega projects, we will have a better idea how to face the development and prepare comprehensive cost estimates according to the development timetable and draw up financing proposals in a timely manner. As the government makes an all-out effort to boost economic growth, the construct construction industry will enter a golden era with abundant opportunities. There will be a keen demand for manpower to support various public works and infrastructural projects. We are making reference to the construction manpower forecast released by the Construction Industry Council in February this year to assess how to address manpower needs of the construction sector through a multi-pronged strategy. As indicated earlier, our target is to complete the assessment and present a holistic strategy for addressing manpower needs of the sector by middle 2023. Relevant work is in progress according to the target time frame, and we will make an announcement in due course. 
subject to passage of the budget, we will use the $170 million allocation to launch two pilot schemes as soon as possible in collaboration with the Vocational Training Council, Construction Industry Council, and other institutions to provide on-the-job training allowance for safety officers and other construction personnel. The schemes not only enhance the education and career ladder and promote youth upward mobility, but also help expand the source of manpower supply for training up construction talents. The two schemes are expected to benefit about 1,300 trainees. We will continue to join hands with the Construction Industry Council to step up the training of skilled workers in the construction industry with a $2.2 billion allocation grant last year. We will also promote to the industry the wider adoption of innovation technology through the Construction Innovation Technology Fund. We will also collaborate with the industry and institutions to step up recruitment and training of construction talents. We're happy to note that members have generally expressed support for the land development projects to be undertaken by the government. We will continue to engage the council and industry stakeholders so that we make a concerted effort to improve people's livelihood and promote economic development in Hong Kong. I so submit. Secretary for Housing. President, I thank members for offering their views on housing during the appropriation bills debate. I will now give a brief reply on these views. Many members mentioned their concern over light public housing. If I may reiterate, light public housing is a large-scale social project with very significant social function and value. It will give practical assistance to those with the most pressing needs. The government has given holistic consideration to various aspects. In designing and planning for individual projects, we will take into account numerous factors, including the land use characteristics, the local transportation network, developments in the vicinity and cost effectiveness. Suitable supporting facilities will be provided in a pragmatic manner so as to meet the needs of residents in their daily life. On cost effectiveness, the project team is continuously reviewing its design and has achieved cost reduction of a billion dollars from the initial design. Building modules under the MIC method can be removed and reused. In terms of locational choices, the eight proposed sites are located all over the territories to meet residents' needs. We will take forward the projects and also do publicity work so that people in need will know about the project, which is an affordable, desirable and readily available short-term housing option for them. On the supply of public housing units, the government has identified sufficient land for providing some 360,000 public housing units in the next 10 years, meeting the supply target of 301,000 public housing units in the same 10-year period. Some members are concerned about the construction time and workflow. The Hong Kong Housing Authority, or the Hong Kong HA, is constructing public housing at full steam by taking forward preliminary preparation during the land creation process. These preparatory work include drafting outline zoning plans, conducting detailed design, technical assessments, ground investigation, and tender invitation so that construction works may begin swiftly after the handover of land to the HA. Also, we will adopt measures at the planning, design and work stage for early delivery of some public housing projects in phases. We will also more widely adopt MIC building method and design and build procurement model in suitable projects. On Subdivided units. In the short run, we will continue to support families living in inadequate housing by vigorously promoting the development of transitional housing as a short-term option for people in need. As at the end of March this year, some 7,000 such units have commenced operation. We expect another 14,000 transitional housing units to come online in the next two years. Besides, we will continue to take forward tenancy control on subdivided units together with the Rating and Valuation Department so as to better protect SDU tenants' rights. 
as at the end of March this year, we have disbursed some $2.91 billion in cash allowance to some 86,800 eligible general public rental housing applicants through the cash allowance trial scheme. Some members hoped that the trial scheme can be regularized. On that, we will conduct a review at an appropriate time. We believe that with the continuous supply of transitional housing and the light public housing in the coming few years, as well as an abundant supply of conventional public rental housing in the next 10 years, we will be able to change the ecosystem of the SDU rental market and drastically reduce the demand for SDUs with expensive rent and poor environment. There were also views that the government should timely adjust the income limit of public rental housing applicants. The HA conducts a yearly review on the income and assets limits of PRH applicants to align them with the then socio-economic situation. We think the existing mechanism has provided an objective basis for setting an income limit which can effectively identify low-income earners eligible for PRH. Besides, in response to voices in society that the HA should review its policy on subsidized sale flags, the HA swiftly endorsed the revised eligibility criteria last week that PRH tenants applying to purchase subsidized sale flags as green form applicants should not be owners of domestic property in Hong Kong, and that fixed term licensees will no longer be eligible for purchasing subsidized sales flags as green form applicants. The new arrangements will apply to the new home ownership scheme flags to be sold later this year. Many members voiced their concerns over the abuse of public housing resources. We fully agree that public housing is a valuable resource in society, which must be used effectively and allocated reasonably to people with genuine need. The HA has always adopted a multi-pronged approach in tackling abuse of public housing, including preventive patrol, investigation, publicity, and education. Between April 2022 and January this year, 1,700 flags were recovered due to abuse and breach of tenancy or housing policy by tenants, exceeding the past three years' average of 1,300 per year. The HA will review its existing measures and proactively disseminate anti-abuse messages to PRH tenants so as to ensure reasonable use of public housing resources. On private residential property markets, we have considered a range of factors, including the speed and magnitude of property prices movements, number of transactions of residential flags, future supply, economic condition and outlook, and the overall market sentiment. Given the present situation, we don't think it is necessary to adjust the demand-side management measures of residential properties. We will continue to closely monitor the residential property markets and the relevant indicators so as to take timely measures in response to market changes. The government will remain steadfast in resolving the housing issue. Our determination is ironclad. President, I so submit, I implore members to support the Appropriation Bill 2023. Thank you. Secretary for Transport and Logistics. President, I'm deeply grateful to members for their views on the transport and logistics matters under the Appropriation Bill 2023. Here is my brief reply. The government has always promoted the infrastructure-led and capacity-building planning principles in taking forward transport infrastructure projects. This is to unleash the potential of the new development areas along key transport infrastructure. We will focus on traffic bottlenecks in improving our transport network to give people more commuting options and cut down journey time. We will also act with forward thinking by supporting long-term development, such as the northern metropolis and the artificial islands of Kao Chao, and meet the transport and logistics needs arising from integration. The government plans to take forward the three strategic railways and three major roads in the preliminary recommendations of the strategic studies on railways and major roads beyond 2030. The public consultation was concluded in late March. 
We are studying the comments received from members and the public in detail and assessing the preliminary engineering feasibility to enhance the proposal. Our goal is to draw up a blueprint for the future development of Hong Kong's key transport infrastructure in the fourth quarter of this year. On cross-boundary railways, the government will continue to work through the task force for Hong Kong Shenzhen cooperation on cross-boundary railway infrastructure in taking forward various projects. On this front, the second stage study of the Hong Kong Shenzhen Western Rail Link, Hong Shui Kiu Chen Hai, is underway to be completed in the middle of next year. Meanwhile, we are actively following up on the work on the Northern Link Spur Line. We plan to reach an agreement with the mainland authorities on the Shenzhen section of the Spur Line and start the detailed planning and design within next year. To ensure swift launch of the various railway projects related to the Northern Metropolis, we propose to set up a dedicated Northern Metropolis Railways office under the Highways Department. The proposal will go to the Establishment Subcommittee under the Finance Committee of this Council soon. I hope members will support the proposal. Two days ago, the government announced the scheme on northbound travel for Hong Kong vehicles. Application will open on June 1st for eligible Hong Kong private cars. Starting from July 1st, approved Hong Kong private cars will be allowed to travel between Hong Kong and Guangdong via the Hong Kong Zhuha Macau Bridge. The scheme makes it easier for Hong Kong residents to get behind the wheel for short-term visits to Guangdong for business, family, or travel purposes. This is a key step in fostering the economic integration and interactions between people in the Greater Bay Area. To cope with the extra workload from applications for cross-boundary vehicle licenses and the scheme, the Transport Department has streamlined the application procedure, lined up officers to work overtime, deployed staff members, and hired more workers. This is to make sure swift processing of applications for closed road permits. The TD will continue to make good use of electronic services and study measures to offer greater convenience, such as looking into the feasibility of mutual recognition of driving licenses for commercial vehicles from Guangdong, Hong Kong, and Macau based on the mutual recognition in place for driving licenses of non-commercial vehicles from the three places. The government moves with the times by monitoring the latest developments of public transport systems in the mainland and across the globe. We look at the systems, applications, and cost effectiveness of various models in exploring their viability in Hong Kong. Members have commented on the public transport infrastructure in Kowloon East, particularly in the Kai Tech development area. We will have regard to the latest development plans and the traffic conditions after the local transport services come on stream and stick to the multimodal environmentally friendly linkage system already confirmed. We will continue to consider the latest technologies in green and smart mass transit systems in the mainland and around the world in exploring ways to enhance the eco-friendly linkage system. The goal is to boost the efficiency, cost effectiveness, and sustainability of the local transport network. We are also actively promoting public transport running on electricity and other forms of new energy. The terms of the existing franchise agreement between the government and the franchised bus operators require that the latter to procure the greenest models as much as reasonably practicable when they buy new buses, with the ultimate goal being an entire fleet of zero carbon emission buses. Meanwhile, the Environmental Protection Department is running a pilot scheme for electric ferries covering four in Harbour ferry routes. There is full subsidy for the building costs of four new electric ferries and their ancillary charges and their operating expenses during the pilot period. I thank the Finance Committee for approving on April 28th the funding proposals on loan schemes with a 100% guarantee for the cross-boundary passenger trade and battery e-taxis under the budget. Those proposals will help the trade resume operation and encourage taxi owners to switch to battery e-taxis. The loan scheme for the cross-boundary passenger trade was launched on April 29th. We are working to launch the loan scheme for battery e-taxis in the middle of this year. Members expressed concern over the requests to, requ to raise fares from public transport operators. Our established policy is that public transport services should be provided by private firms in line with commercial principles to ensure efficiency in service as well as a swift and re flexible response to market conditions. 
we will review such requests with due diligence under the established mechanism by considering the operator's financial position, business prospect, public acceptance, and affordability in acting as the gatekeeper. I thank members for their recognition of the public transport fare subsidy scheme. The temporary special measures under the scheme is extended to the end of October this year. We expect the extension will benefit around 3.5 million people per month. Now, given the sheer number of people covered, the annual recurrent expenditure exceeds $3 billion. In considering long-term arrangements, the government will carefully balance various factors to ensure public funds are well spent. On air transport, the Hong Kong International Airport is seeing a steady recovery in its air traffic volume. Members expressed concern over whether we have enough airport workers to sustain the recovery in the aviation industry. We are working with the Hong Kong Airport Authority to explore possible options to address manpower issues in the trade, including the proposal to bring in workers from other GBA cities to meet the demand for frontline staff at the airport. Our goal is to devise the relevant measures later this year. We also continue to take forward various infrastructure projects under the third runway project and the airport city vision to boost our airport's capacity and functions in handling passengers and cargoes. The government will continue to negotiate with aviation partners over air traffic rights to expand Hong Kong's aviation network. This is to strengthen our role as a hub for international aviation. To further enhance Hong Kong's status as an international shipping, aviation, and the logistics hub, the government will inject 200 million Hong Kong dollars into the Maritime and Aviation Training Fund. This is to support training in the trade, foster the development of high-end, high-value-added, and smart logistics, and encourage the trade to work with tertiary institutions and other professional bodies to enhance the trade's image through a full range of publicity campaigns. This is to attract more young people to the trade and promote our strengths in shipping, aviation, and logistics to the overseas community. President, I so submit. I urge members to support the appropriation bill. Thank you. Secretary for Labor and Welfare. Mr. President, in the debate of the resumption of second reading of the appropriation bill. A number of members have spoken on social welfare and labor. I would like to thank them for their views, and I would like to uh, reply to these views. First, in relation to funding on social welfare and poverty alleviation, recurrent spending on social welfare for 2023 to 24 is estimated to be $121 billion, accounting for 21.6% of total recurrent expenditure. It's the largest among all policy areas. I would like to um, address the points raised by Mr. Tik Chi Yoon. The, administra the administration has said a number of times in different platforms that about the importance of spending reduction program in 2022 and 23. The program aims to meet physical challenges and to strengthen physical discipline. All departments are required to reduce spending for the challenging times ahead. The reduction of expenditure on social welfare under the program is around $280 million. We have considered it very carefully and have made special arrangements so that cash assistance in CSSA and Social Security Allowance, grants and allowances for foster families, sheltered workshops, and integrated vocational rehabilitation services centers, as well as short-term food assistance, will not be affected. These special arrangements ensure that the impact of the reduction program on grassroots will be kept to a minimum. The fact is, if you look at the government's commitment on social welfare, you see that the amount actually has increased. In 2022 to 23, which is under the reduction program, expenditure on welfare increased by about $9 billion, 9% compared to the year before, that is 21 to 22. The estimates of 2023 and 24 increases further to about, to about $15 billion, with, and compared to the reduction of the $300 million 
15 billion is about uh, 300 times. So yes, we have reduced, we have cut down one tree in the forest, but we have planted 50 more. So the expenditure as a whole has increased significantly. I asked Mr. Tick to see the, the grand picture, and it also shows the government's commitment to help those in need. I would now move on to targeted poverty alleviation. This is uh, something the chief executive has given us uh, guiding directions. We have a direction, we have commitment, and we have plans. Last year, we have launched the Strive and Rise program. And with the work of the new term of uh, Commission on Poverty, we have identified certain target groups, about 210 thousand people uh, living in subdivided flats, single parents, families, 210,000, as well as about uh, 550,000 um, singleton elderly living alone. And we are talking about 14% of our population. The coverage is quite extensive. The Commission on Poverty will follow the major principle of a targeted poverty alleviation to come to implement the measures under this scope, the government will definitely provide su financial support. When it comes to taking care of uh, the underprivileged, the government is determined. We thank members for giving us constructive suggestions to help the government for the good of the people. I appeal to members, including Mr. Tik Chi Yun, to support the budget with an increase in spending on welfare. I would like to take this opportunity to talk about elderly services. To tackle the challenges of an aging population, the government has been increasing spending. Starting this year, we will increase about 2,200 subvented places and will regularize the residential care service voucher scheme and provide additional resources to upgrade EA2 homes to meet EA1 standards. In the coming five years, we will subsidize more than 1,700 students to enroll in enrolled nurse general training. There is a condition. They have to work in welfare organizations for three years after graduation. We want to make sure that there is enough enrolled nurses to serve in social welfare organizations. We will regularize the community care service voucher scheme. The number of beneficiaries will increase to 12,000. And in the coming five years, we will establish 16 new Neighborhood elderly centers. We currently have 213 neighborhood elderly centers and uh, district elderly centers. 45,000 people will benefit under the integrated discharge support program for elderly patients. Furthermore, we will encourage the provision of elderly homes in new private developments. On enhanced support for carers, we will implement a number of measures. Starting from October this year, four financial assistance schemes will be regularized. And there are two living allowances for carers from low-income families. The amount will increase from 2400 to 3000 involving an annual expenditure of about $430 billion. There will be a new um, dedicated round-the-clock hotline, hotline and website for carers. Risk by services will increase. And the inquiry system for daycare, respite, and residential places will be enhanced. There is also a territory-wide publicity campaign lasting three years to law, um, for the promotion of peer support for carers. We're also concerned about um, competing for talents. To alleviate manpower shortage, this term of government is committed to draw for talents. Over the four months since the launch of a series of measures, we have received over 60,000 applications with over 33,000 applications approved. 25,000 applications have been received under the Top Talent Pass scheme with 15,000 applications approved. We'll continue to monitor these schemes and make adjustments as appropriate. The Labor and Welfare Bureau and Policy Bureaus will review the talent list. The work is almost complete. We will, in the short term, make an announcement so that um, 
we will meet the needs of the industries. A number of members have spoken about their concern as to whether outside talents can actually address the manpower shortage here and um, in relation to long-term long -term support for outside talents. We have launched the Hong Kong Talent Engage website to provide a one-stop inquiry service for those who would like to come. They can make use of this uh, website to look for vacancies here. We are liaising with the various organizations to establish a network. The service will be launched in the middle of this year. The Bureau is preparing for the setup of a physical um, service, including the recruitment of the head of the service uh, to provide support. Well, in relation to uh, members' view that outside talents are only an expedient measure, well, and that we should focus on nurturing local talent. That is that actually is in line with our main thrust of policy to nurture local talents. We will work with the Employees Retraining Board to enhance skills of uh, local labor, and we will launch a new round of manpower proje projection uh, to uh, take stock of the various demands and um, skills required by different industries. We're well, starting from the 1st of May 2025, as the, as, as the Chief Executive has announced, the offsetting mechanism of, of the Mandatory Provident Fund will be abolished. The government will go to the Finance Committee to ask for funding support for the subsidy scheme to provide subsidy of more than $33 billion over 25 years to employees. We have engaged a consultant to look at the designated savings account scheme to map out the way forward. I so submit and I ask members to support the bill. Thank you. Secretary for Financial Services and the Treasury, Chairman, President, first of all, I'd like to thank members for their valuable feedback to the FSTB during the 2023 Appropriation Bill debate. I would like to provide some responses regarding Hong Kong's role as a financial center, the new capital investment entrance scheme, and the opportunities for professional services in Hong Kong's finance industry due to GBA development, development of green tech, green finance, introduction of redomiciliation, and nurturing of financial services talent. Hong Kong's foundation as a developing finance center is rock solid. The restoration of social order and easing of COVID have provided a con conducive environment for financial services development. The 20th National Congress Report and 14 five-year plan provide direction for future development strategy. Combined with the mainlands, with the motherlands, immense support will continue to utilize the foundation of one country, two systems. We have an efficient market platform and we will play the role of super facilitator. Uh, Hong Kong will continue to leverage its strengths, serve the motherland. We will play our role in dual circulation, develop different investment classes, promote innovative financial field development, and also cater to different corporate financing and asset management team uh, management needs. And we'll also promote onshore, offshore bilateral investment via Hong Kong markets and assist the motherland's finance and economic needs, and also elevate Hong Kong's financial industry to a higher level. Now, we are now finalizing the details of the capital investment entrance scheme. Overall speaking, the scheme is broadly based on the original capital investment <coughs> entrance scheme framework and application eligibility. Now, the applicant's investment scope in Hong Kong, the investment amount, and other criteria are being scrutinized and possibly adjusted. The government will consider increasing the investment amount by multiples and will also include asset classes beneficial to Hong Kong's long-term development aside from financial assets in order to attract more investment and talent to Hong Kong. We will inject new vitality and promote industry development. We will make an announcement later after the details and specific application arrangements have been ironed out. 
Now we are actively developing the family office business. We have submitted to LegCo the 2022 tax con concessions for family owned investment holding vehicles bill. Now this will allow single family owned business who manage assets, uh, investment holdings in Hong Kong, they will uh, receive tax concessions. When the bill is enacted, the concessions will be applicable to the it will be applicable to any fiscal year after 1st of April 2022. In March 2023, the government announced a policy statement on developing f family office businesses in Hong Kong. So for global family offices and asset holders, we have spelt out our uh, position and measures. We also hosted the Wealth for Good uh, Summit Conference in March this year where we had uh, meetings with global family office decision makers. In the coming three years, the government will also set aside $100 million for Invest Hong Kong's Family Office Task Force. We will strengthen the public relations. We will step up promotion. We will host events in Hong Kong, mainland and overseas so we can meet directly with our target customers and enhance our, competi our competitiveness and attract more family, business, uh, family offices to Hong Kong. Now we attach a lot of importance to Greater Bay Area development and its impact on Hong Kong finance industry and uh, the immense opportunities afforded to professional services. The central government and relevant central ministries have issued a lot of important documents. Now these will help Hong Kong's finance industry develop. And in particular, the outline development plan for Guangdong, Hong Kong and Macau document spells out the role of Hong Kong. It will strengthen and enhance Hong Kong's uh, uh, role as a financial hub. We will have orderly promotion of financial uh, market integration. Uh, we will help build the GBA into a financial hub in February this year. The Central Ministry and Guangdong People's Government uh, issued an opinion on providing financial support for comprehensive developing, uh, for comprehensive deepening reform and opening up of Tianhai Senzhen Hong Kong Modern Service Industry Corporation Zone. Now, this will expand Hong Kong finance uh, enterprise role in the Tianhai area. It will bring about new opportunities for finance institutions. We will continue to work with the relevant central ministries. We will strengthen the integration between Hong Kong and uh, mainland. We will promote innovation and so on. Now, green tech and uh, green uh, finance is a global trend. Now, Hong Kong is a leading green finance center in the Asia area. In 2022, the total issue of green bonds and green loans uh, compared to 2021, there was an increase of 40% and it reached 80.5 billion US dollars. And amongst that, uh, the green bonds and sustainable bonds off issued in Hong Kong made up 35% uh, of the bonds ish, green bonds issued in Asia. We will continue to leverage our strengths. We will continue to build Hong Kong as a green finance center. We will continue to be an innovator. We will contribute to the country's 3060 dual carbon goals. The budget had also set aside some policies to help Hong Kong develop into a green uh, technology and finance center. We also, the government has also set up a Green Technology and Finance Development Committee it, where uh, policies will be formulated. Now, the market has also uh, been reflecting, or the market has also been calling for re um legislation. So, uh, we now, we will now be introducing a more um, policies to allow this so we can avoid the complex and uh, liquidation arrangements uh, that are conducted through the court and we will help facilitate the redomiciliation in Hong Kong. In March this year we conducted a two-month um, consultation exercise. We heard from the different stakeholders and also 
drafted the different bills and the goal is to submit these bills for scrutiny in the legislative year 23-24. Now we also need to build talent. We need a deep and broad talent uh, in order to provide uh, excellent service, uh, in order to maintain our competitiveness as an international financial hub. Now for, uh, to, towards this end, the government continues to nurture talent, to create opportunities for the industry. And one of our long-term strategy goals is to help the industry crafts, green tech, uh, green finance, and so on. For example, in order to train the relevant uh, talent, we provide subsidies for banks, for securities companies, for the insurance industry. We uh, help provide different internship schemes and so on. But we have also extended the pilot program to enhance talent training for asset and wealth management sector. For uh, We've extended another three years in order to nurture more talent in this area to enhance their professional uh, qualifications. Now these measures and other talent recruiting schemes can attract the relevant um, uh, personnel. Chairman, that, uh, President, that concludes my uh, speech and I would like uh, you to uh, support the appropriation bill. Secretary for Innovation Technology Industry, President, I'm grateful that in the second reading debate last week, members have raised valuable views on the innovation and technology INT development and the INT initiatives in the budget. The budget points out that Hong Kong should give full play to our advantages as an international INT hub. We will continue to adopt a result-oriented approach and strive to integrate with the national strategy, especially positioning given by the national 14th five-year plan of Hong Kong to be an INT hub. And we should serve Hong Kong people well and live up to the expectations of our country of our country to further realize the vision for Hong Kong to be turned into an international INT hub. We released the Hong Kong INT development blueprint last year. This year's budget also corresponds to the development directions and key strategies in the blueprint, blueprint in the following four areas. I will respond to members' concerns under this framework. First, developing digital infrastructure and promoting digital transformation. We will press ahead with the development of a digital economy. On the development of digital infrastructure, we will conduct a feasibility study on the development of an AI supercomputing center, which is expected to provide adequate computing infrastructure for promoting the development of industries. The study will be completed within this financial year. Some members suggested that we should first set up a mini computing center as a pilot and then expand the scale and also setting up a data industrial park in Hong Kong in the North Metropolis. And some members suggested that we should leverage on AI to enhance government service efficiency. We, mean, we will carefully study into these proposals. In addition, to, we will work through um, the technology voucher scheme to help SMEs in uh, digital transformation. We will allocate $500 million to Cyberport to launch the Digital Transformation Support Pilot Program, whereby subsidies will be provided on a one-on-one -on -one matching basis to assist SMEs to expedite digitalization. To promote data sharing, I noticed that some members have suggested that Hong Kong should set up a central data bureau in Hong Kong to oversee development of digital economy and society and coordinating uh, the standardization work and improving information flow among departments. We have an open mind towards that proposal. We are also pressing ahead with building the consented data exchange gateway to promote um, the exchange of data among the different departments of personal data with individuals 
uh, authorization. Second, consolidating Hong Kong's R&D and strengthening the promoting tech tech industry development to give full play to Hong Kong's advantages in basic research blueprint. The blueprint proposes enhancing R&D ecosystem and promoting coordinated development, assisting universities in making breakthroughs out of the blue. Some members suggested that the government should enhance support to commercialization of R&D output. We will work through the Innovation and Technology Fund, including the Research, Academic and res Industry Sectors One Plus scheme to be launched, and local universities possess many original R&D results with great potential for commercialization. However, universities as academic institutions may not be able to substantially invest in commercialization of R&D uh, output. The Race Plus scheme can provide assistance. Some members also suggested that there are Race Plus scheme be extended to cover other UGC-funded institutions. We will consider that. On consolidating R&D strengths and promoting technology industry development, key measures include allocating $50 million to expedite the Web3 ecosystem development, setting aside $6 billion out of the $10 billion earmarked to provide subsidies for universities and research institutes to set up thematic research centers related to life and health technology. Here, marking $3 billion to promote the development of frontier technology fields like AI and quantum technology and establish a microelectronics research and development institute. These measures do not only support the development of the relevant industries, but also further enhance Hong Kong's IMT ecosystem to expedite the development of a collaborative innovation system of the industry and create greater synergy among industries. I'd like to thank members for their support of establishing the Microelectronics Institute. We are proceeding with full steam with the preparatory work, and we plan to seek the electrical's views within this financial year. In addition, I noticed that members have expressed their hope uh, for R&D expenditure to be increased. As we implement various policies to encourage INT development, I think the uh, results will be seen gradually. We will be heading progressively towards the vision and goals set out in the blueprint. Third, nurturing technology startups and talents. Nurturing technology startups and talent is crucial to enhancing the INT ecosystem. Our two flagships in INT, uh, HKS, TPC, and Cyberport have strived to provide startups with infrastructure, incubation programs, and one-stop support services. And the government has launched a host of measures to attract, nurture, and retain talents in a bid to strengthen our talent pool. In the budget, it is stipulated that the Hong Kong STPC will inject $400 million into its corporate venture fund and allocate $110 million to launch the co a celebration program to support the growth of technology startups with high potential into regional or global enterprises. In addition, a provision of $265 million has been earmarked to for Sabapur to launch a dedicated incubation program for smart living startups. It is envisaged that about 90 startups will benefit from the program in each of the next five years. We will also earmark $300 million to extend the IT Innovation Lab in secondary schools program. These will provide more INT talent for the local INT industry and enterprises. Fourth, developing INT infrastructure and promoting new industrialization. Many members are concerned about the progress of INT infrastructure and new industrialization. We strive to promote new industrialization um, as a major development direction through policies to promote technology industries. We seek to focus on um, industries like life and health technology, AI data science, advanced manufacturing, new energies, etc. We are uh, pressing ahead with infrastructure at various uh, locations. The first three buildings of the Hong Kong Shenzhen INT Park in the Lok Ma Chao Loop will be gradually completed from the end of next 
year onwards. And the planning department and CEDD will begin the consultation on the development proposals and land use planning of Santin Technopo in the second quarter of this year for commencement of site formation works in 2024. And the HKSPTPC is also conducting a feasibility study on the setting up of the second AMC. This new infrastructure will be conducive to the development of INT enterprises and promote new industrialization. The Finance Committee of the LEGCO will scrutinize next month the creation of the post of Commissioner for Industry. The post order will enhance our capability in formulating new industrialization policies and take forward the relevant tasks. I look forward to members' support uh, to the application. Once the FC gives the green light, we will start recruitment uh, immediately. <coughs> President, members, uh, people should be the center of a nation. The government's policy should be linked closely to people's life livelihood. We should leverage on INT to improve people's uh, quality of life. This year's budget will allocate more resources to help Hong Kong's INT sector to scale new heights. We hope to uh, improve people's quality of living and drive economic development. I look forward to members' support for us to give full play to pull the strengths of the government's industry, academia and research sector so that we can press ahead with building Hong Kong into an international INT hub, contribute to our country's efforts in achieving self-reliance of the high tech sector at higher levels and create a better future for Hong Kong. I so submit an appeal to members' support for the Appropriation Bill 2023. Secretary for Commerce and Economic Development. Mr. President, I will respond to the parts of the uh, resumption of second reading debate relating to the Commerce and Economic Development Bureau. First of all, I thank members for their invaluable views. The focus of the CEDB as well as the initiatives in the budget relating to our bureau revolve around one theme, that is to enhance the momentum of Hong Kong's economic development. We must tide local enterprises over the pandemic so that together we set off again and scale new heights. Having listened to members, I notice that members are concerned mostly about two aspects. The first is how we can boost the local economic strength, and the second is how we strive for more external development opportunities. On enhancing our economic strength, this government attaches great importance to attracting businesses and investments. The Office for Attracting Strategic Enterprises, OASIS, under the Secretary, was commissioned in the end of last year. The dedicated teams for attracting businesses and talents set up at the Hong Kong Economic and Trade Offices will support the OASIS and the Talents Service Unit, TSU, of the Labor and Welfare Bureau by proactively reaching out to the target enterprises and talents around the world to attract and assist them in setting up or expanding operations in Hong Kong. Invest Hong Kong will make good use of the additional resources allocated since 2022-23 to strengthen investment promotion work. The government will continue to support local SMEs. They've made significant contributions to Hong Kong's economy, yet they're also the most susceptible to external headwinds. A number of members have pointed out that in the short term, SMEs will continue to face challenges in their businesses. The government has been supporting SMEs through the SME Financing Guarantee Scheme, SFGS, and the dedicated fund on branding, upgrading, and domestic sales of the BUD Fund. Both schemes are well received by the business sector. As announced in the budget, the government will extend the application period for all guarantee products under the SFGS from the end of June this year to the end of March next year. An injection of $500 million will be made into the BUD fund. But easy will be launched to expedite the vetting of applications involving a funding amount of $100,000 or below as a response to members and the sector's aspirations. The government will also allocate $100 million to enhance the services of SME reach out in the next five years to assist SMEs in building their capacities. We'll keep our ear to the ground to understand what SMEs need and help them gain a footing and tap development opportunities. 
as the pandemic ebbs, I'm happy to see that the convention and exhibition activities in the past few months have received a positive response. Many large-scale C&E events have been lined up. In July this year, the government will launch a $1.4 billion incentive scheme for recurring exhibitions to further bolster Hong Kong as a premier location for recurring large-scale international exhibitions to be held. It is expected to provide incentives to over 200 exhibitions over three years. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank members for their support to the new scheme. Apart from enhancing our edge, we must also strive for more external development opportunities. Some members have expressed their wish for Hong Kong's early accession to the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, or RCEP. This wish is shared by the Hong Kong SAR government. We'll maintain close liaison with RCEP member states and actively lobby their support to strive for Hong Kong's early accession to the RCEP. In addition, to help Hong Kong enterprises and investors tap new markets, the government has always strived to strengthen trade ties with other economies, to dovetail with the country's 14th five-year plan and leverage on the advantage of having the country's support and being connected with the world, we will actively seek to forge trade, free trade agreements and investment promotion protection agreements with more economies, in particular emerging economies, so that goods and services from Hong Kong can be treated more favorably in the global market, hence promoting Hong Kong's economic development in the long term. This year marks the 10th anniversary of the Belt and Road Initiative. The government is actively taking forward the preparation of the 8th Belt and Road Summit in Hong Kong. We will also provide additional funding, totaling $550 million, to Hong Kong Trade Development Council in the next five years, starting from this year, to help enterprises seize opportunities arising from the Belt and Road Initiative, tap new markets, and step up global promotional efforts. The Hong Kong TDC will make good use of the said funding to enhance support for Hong Kong enterprises to tap opportunities in the Greater Bay Area. The Hong Kong TDC will gradually set up more Go GBA business support centers under the Go GBA One Stop platform to cover all nine cities in the Greater Bay Area, as well as implementing the support scheme for pursuing development in the mainland to get and Hong Kong enterprises equipped for the mainland market. I've noticed that some members are concerned about the development of Hong Kong into regional intellectual property trading center. I'm grateful for their support. An input. These are very useful in helping us uh, draw, move forward. Let me supplement with the following. The Copyright Amendment Ordinance 2022 came into force a couple of days ago. That is the 1st of July. It will, uh, 1st of May, it will strengthen copyright protection in the digital environment. We'll also submit to the Council the proposed subsidiary legislation relating to the implementation of the Madrid pro Protocol in Hong Kong as soon as possible. We'll also allocate resources to further promote and develop the original grant patent system to progressively increase the number of patent examiners of the IP department to about 100 with a view to acquiring institutional autonomy in conducting substantive patent examination. On the patent box tax incentive, we'll consult the trade within this year. Our target is to submit the legislative amendment proposals to LegCo within the first half of 2024. On the whole, we will step up our efforts to dovetail with the 14 five-year plan so as to create a favorable condition for IP trading in Hong Kong. On telecommunications, the government will continue to actively promote 5G development. The budget has proposed to provide tax deduction for spectrum utilization fees payable by operators for the radio spectrum bid in future so as to encourage telecommunications network operators to further invest in 5G infrastructure. The CDB is amending the relevant legislation and guidelines to ensure that appropriate space is made available in new buildings for the installation of mobile telecommunication facilities. We will continue to implement a series of measures, including incentives for network operators to extend fiber-based networks to remote and village areas to consolidate our status as a regional telecommunications hub. With these remarks, I urge members to support the bill. I now call upon the Financial Secretary to reply. Mr. President and Honourable Members, Members of the Public, good morning. 
I would like to extend my heartfelt thanks to honourable members for giving their valuable views on the 2023-24 budget at the Legislative Council meeting last week. Many views and reminders were given to us. Seven directors of bureaus have just now given concise responses in certain important policy areas that are of concern to members. I will now report to you the economic condition globally and in Hong Kong. The thinking behind the budget and also some more sup supplements on members' views. First, on global economic situation. Now, the year past can be described as difficult. The situation has deteriorated in year 2022 and 23. We have the tense geopolitical situation as well as the Russian-Ukraine conflict. And also, we have in high inflation causing a rapid increase in interest rate, which has remained on a high level for a long period of time. It has undermined the global economic performance. And also recently in the US and also in Europe, there are banks closure, which cause an impact on the financial system. Now, the IMF in April forecasts that the global economic growth would further moderate from 3.4% last year to 2.8% this year. And also, the IMF said there would be a high risk of hard landing. Now, let's look at the major economies. In the first quarter, the performance of the U.S. economy was weak. The year-on-year -year growth was 1%. Now, that is the growth rate of the year not for a quarter. Now, last year, the growth was 3.4%. The labor market was still weak. And there is little likelihood for the high inflation rates to climb down. Now, the market is expecting at least another round of interest rate hike by the, by the Federal Reserve, which will cause the interest rates to remain on a, as a high level for a sustained period of time, which will weaken demand. Now, the IMF forecasts the U.S. overall growth for this year will be 1.6%, an obvious decrease from 2.6% last year. Now, Europe, European countries are performing even worse. Now, the IMF expects the growth rates to be 0.1% for the year. Last year, it was 3.5%. Now, the European countries are facing the Russian-Ukraine conflict, high inflation rates, and also weakened liquidity. So these are all the difficulties. Now, fortunately, our country performed better than expected compared with last year. The figures in the first quarter was a 4.5% growth, which exceeded market expectation. Economic growth for the year is expected to be 5%. Now, the market is even more optimistic than that. Some expect the growth to be 6%. Because of external fluctuations and uncertainties, despite the optimistic forecast, we still have to be prudent. Now, there is still room for upward adjustments of the yearly growth beyond 5% for our country. For emerging markets in the Asian Pacific region, they performed admirably last year in terms of exports. However, it's weakened in October. Now, in terms of US dollars, the export value has dropped. The IMF expects the GDP growth for emerging markets in Asia to be 5.3%, which is still better than last year. So that's the external economic situation. Now, what's the implication for us? Now, Hong Kong is a small, open economy. Any external headwind would cause a lot of disruption for us. 
Now I talk about the global economic situation and that of major economies. Now we understand that the economic decoupling caused by tense geopolitical situation is getting more and more obvious. Over the past year, you might have heard a lot of comments from economists. Now, because of geopolitical tension, originally there is a complete supply chain in our country, but some investors are thinking about moving parts of the supply chain onshore out of China. Now, we are talking about micro electronic sector, and the US government is giving a lot of subsidies to get these businesses back to the US. And also, they are French shore, which are our alliances, and also near shore competitors. Now, the economic implication caused by political tension would cause changes to the global supply chain and industries everywhere. Now, some there are talks about China, the idea of China plus one. So it would disrupt the export market. Now, Hong Kong is an entry port. We have a lot of transshipment business, so the disruption for us would also be obvious. And also, there will be more interest rate increase. Even if there is only one round of interest rate hike ahead of 0.25%, it will still cause inflation rates to remain on a high level and it will reduce liquidity in the banking sector. Now we have to be focused on the implication on society brought about by fluctuations in the banking sector. Now in response, the Hong Kong SAR government is adopting a, the bottom line thinking. We are conducting risk assessments for different scenarios. We have solutions ready so that we can endure any fluctuations. And we want to build up a strong buffer. And besides risk mitigation, we have to pursue development. So that is what the country told us to do. We have to strike a balance between security and economic development. Stability is the premise on which we can pursue economic development, and economic development can ensure safety and security. Now, what about Hong Kong? Last year, our performance was mediocre. We, our GDP growth dropped by 3.5%, and our free economic pillars have seen a drop. For exports, a drop of 14% growth. For fixed capital investment, a drop of 7.7%. The only pillar with less reduction was consumption, a drop of 1.6% only. Now, inflation last year was 1.9%. The reason is, is that we base the calculation of inflation on family consumption. Now, rent last year dropped by 40%, so that offsets part of the inflation inflationary pressure. In terms of unemployment, it dropped from the peak in February 5.4% to 3.5% in the end of last year. Now, the asset market, we have seen a 15% decline in the financial and stock markets. Now, for the first 10 months last year, the stock market declined by 47%. However, there was a strong rebound towards the end of last year, so the yearly reduction was 15%. The daily turnover was some $150 billion. For property markets, we saw an orderly adjustment, a decline of 15%. Now, the peak was at was in September 2021, so altogether there was a reduction of 80% as last year. Now last year was an orderly adjustment. 
I say that's because the Hong Kong SAR government is, has been closely monitoring the property market. When the property market declined, there was a huge drop, a plunge in the transaction volume. There were only 45,050 transactions last year. In 2021, there were more than 75,000 transactions. Well, the, the average between 2000 Zero three two thousand twenty one. Every year, we had more than sixty thousand transactions of property every year. So last year, despite a decline, it was an orderly decline. The low transaction volume means that buyers were more prudent because of the unfavorable condition say, for example, inflation rate. However, we didn't see a panic sellout in the property market. That's why we say this is an orderly adjustment. And you have to consider that the decline was from a very high and unaffordable level. That's why the HKSAR government only had to monitor the orderly adjustments in the market. So that's the economic situation last year. Now, moving on, into year 2023. It is a better year. On one hand, we have the epidemic under control and we have resumed cross-boundary travel. Society as a whole has become happier. We have removed the social distancing measures and activities have resumed. We are open to the world again. Now, international flights capacity have resumed by half only. However, the ambience is good. So overall speaking, we have a more optimistic year ahead. However, in the first two months, our export volume has dropped by some 20%. A, an even larger drop compared with the fourth quarter last year. Fortunately, because of the resumption of cross-boundary travel, we have visitors to Hong Kong and export of services has increased by 16%. The tourists are spending in Hong Kong and also with the consumption voucher scheme, private consumption has increased by 12.5%. It somehow helped the plunge in export volume. Now, because of the better ambience, we have seen a turnaround in the fixed capital investments sector. From 7.7%, it has increased to it has increased by 5.8%. Now, inflation rate hasn't soared. It is still 1.9%. We expect the overall headline inflation rate to be 2.5%. Unemployment rate has been continuously declining. It is now at 3.1%. For the asset market, In the first quarter this year, we have seen a mild rebound in property prices. It has rebounded by 5% in terms of price and transaction volume. Riding on the plunge last year, in January, we had a weak transaction performance. In February, we had some 4,000. In March, we, have, we had some 6,690 transactions in terms of property. So we have to be prudent in terms of interpreting the data. Now we have seen the adjustments and we have seen a steady rebound. We are entering a phase of stability. So that's the situation for the property markets. In terms of stock, for the first three months, we have seen a 3% increase and then a reduction in April. Compared with the same period last year, the situation the level is around the same. The turnover is about some $127 billion. So we can say that it is a stable condition. So that's how our economy compared with the first quarter last year in Hong Kong. So besides figure, we also pay attention to real income of our of the people. Now in the first quarter, real income has increased by some 4.9%. So that's the present situation. So to summarize, preliminary speaking, the first quarter 
economic situation is better than the fourth quarter last year, and of course the first quarter. Now the second quarter will be better than the first quarter, so this year will be better than last year. The year's GDP growth will be in the range of 3.5 to 5.5 percent. So allow me to use this opportunity to explain something to the public. That is the thinking of the government behind this budget. Last year, in preparation for the budget, we expected poor performance in export and investment environments. The only thing the government could do was to boost private consumption and to do our best to save the SMEs and hence save employment. Last year, a major policy measures were the 100% loan guarantee free scheme for SMEs, increasing the loan capacity and also extending the principal moratorium. So if the if businesses want to continue, we will help them in order to save the employees employed by them. Now SMEs account for more than 98% in our economy. They are employing more than 45% of our labor force, and many of them are grassroots to middle class people. So this is a very important sector. We can ensure stability in society by helping SMEs and also stabilize prices. So when the so to allow some room for unemployment rates to climb down. So that's why we were able to rise above the difficulty last year. The second point was to boost consumption. So last year, we issued consumption vouchers. I thank everyone for your help. The rollout was smooth. So that's what happened last year. We made it through. Turning to this month, as we were drawing up the budget this year, things are looking better. But then we had to shore up things. In the first two months, more than 20% drop in exports, and then no one knew how things would play out in geopolitics. So we have to support consumption. I know some members may not fully agree with another round of consumption vouchers this year, but I hope you can see why we're doing this. Even though we're in a financially tight spot, we roll out consumption vouchers this year. But we are scaling back the consumption vouchers. We're halving the amount. In the early stage of an economic recovery, people and SMEs are still under immense pressure. So there were tax refunds, rate concessions last year. This year, we continue the measures. But as you can see, and I hope you can understand that we're scaling back some of these concessions this year. That's how we can strike a balance. So that's for the economy. So for our economy, we cannot just look at what happened. We also have to look at the way ahead. On the way forward, there are both challenges and opportunities. Challenges include external ones and internal ones. For external challenges, there is the geopolitics, the high interest rates, tight financial tightening across different places. This will stay, these problems will stay for a long time. What we can do is to get the risk management right. Now, internally, in the short and medium term, there are these challenges. First, manpower, talent, the supply is tight. Second, land supply is also tight in the short term. This is a constraint on our development. Second, the structure of our industry is too reliant on one or few sectors. We need to enhance our industry structure. We need to boost the quality and strengthen the capacity for development. The last term government and the government before that mentioned the same thing. And we have forged this consensus. Through development, we need to pursue innovation and technology to enhance our industry structure. Artificial intelligence 
as an example, life and health technology, biotechnology, big data, these are the industries. And there is also new energy, new industrialization. These industries can also help the conventional industries upgrade and transform themselves. So this is a key lever for us. We also talked about the tight supply in land and housing. Just then, the Secretary for Development and the Secretary for Housing also covered their work. This is a key area, a priority area for the government, and we go all out on this front. Second, on manpower. On importing talent, we have not just a top talent pass scheme, we have other admission schemes too. These admission schemes have also relaxed their requirements. In late December last year, we rolled out the top talent pass scheme, and then we relaxed the rules for the other admission schemes. The response was good. We received more than 60,000 applications. More than 30,000 of such applications have been approved. So that's a good response. On our labor force, we also have to work on this area. We have to talk to different sectors, including electrical members. We will not shy away from this issue. We will face up to this problem. We will try to work toward a solution that's acceptable to different sectors of the community. This is a problem that's plaguing many sectors. Just then, I mentioned innovation and technology. For the last term government, they put in more than 100, in fact, $200 billion into the area. Now we're seeing vibrancy in innovation and technology. There is the atmosphere, there is the cyberport, science park, tech startups. We're seeing more tech startups, but that's not good enough. And things are not moving fast enough. Even through all these years of work, there are preliminary results, but they have yet to be transformed into an industry and more and better jobs. So for the current term government, we're proposing a capable government and combining that with an efficient market, and we have to be active. That's why the chief executive proposed this in his policy address. We need to attract firms and talent. We set up the Office for Attracting Strategic Enterprises, $30 billion for the co-investment fund. That way, we can speed up the attraction of the key firms from strategic industries to come to Hong Kong. We want to bring them here. We want them to come here to initiate an industry chain. And we can also create better jobs and more job opportunities. We are working on that. In our future economic development, we have always needed our country's support and our country's development. We have the firm support from our motherland. So for our future development, we look not just to our own systems, our institutional strengths, our unique functions, we also have to align with our country's development strategies and, and integrate into national development. Last October, there was a 20th Party Congress, and then this March, there were the two sessions. Our country proposed this, pursuing high-quality development. That's the direction. For the specifics, one focus on innovation and technology, another focus is green development. And there's another focus, supporting private enterprises. And there's also something that spans a wide range of scopes, and that's digital economy. As I said in the budget, our future development is not just the eight centers under the 14 five-year plan, something you're all familiar. We have to open up a new path. We need new room for development. That's why we're proposing, first, the development of a digital economy, and second, we need to promote Web3. Web3, when in relation to virtual assets, issues have come up. We looked into what happened. For cases where things went wrong, they have to do with 
malpractices in operating platforms. Uh, there was a platform mixing up the operator's own assets and those of their clients. And then there is a platform that's a platform and the market maker at the same time leading to a conflict of interest. They came down to the lack of a suitable regulatory framework. Hong Kong is an international financial center. We have an internationally recognized regulatory framework. We want a regulatory framework and bring various industries into the framework. We protect investors, safeguard our financial stability, and make sure the financial activities do not give rise to risks and spreading to the mainland. On that premise, we can pursue development, and that's why we propose a development of Web3. I can tell you this. Last October, we released a policy statement on virtual assets. There was a lot of talk about the statement. I visited Malaysia, Singapore for work. Many people came to me with questions. We had many conferences. A couple of weeks ago, we had an international forum on Web3. The response was very good. Many people flew in to take part in the forum. There were more overseas participants than local participants, tens of thousands of participants in total. We just need to put things in a proper framework for the same activities, the same level of risk. We apply the same regulatory standards, though they can be applied in different ways. So we can ensure that proper compliance is in place, and then the industries can develop in a sustainable and responsible manner. So that's for Web3. My third point here is, as the Acting Secretary for Financial Services and Treasury was saying, we want to develop into a green tech and green fi center. We're doing well in green finance. On green technology, we're also in good shape. At Cyberport and the Science Park, we have over the 100 green tech companies, startups. When I was visiting the Middle East or Malaysia, Singapore, I saw them. One young per, there was this young person. They studied how the ants managed to survive in the Sahara Desert. And then the researchers found something special about the exterior of the ants. So they used the nanotechnology to develop new coating. The coating is applied to the external walls of buildings and that can help lower the indoor temperature so they don't need that much air conditioning and that saves on energy bills. There was a re recent visit to the science park. I was there. Young people found a new way to conserve corals. That technology has been exported too. We are part of the Greater Bay Area. As you know, Shenzhen is doing well in technological development. They want to be a green tech, green finance center. And we can develop alongside with Shenzhen and achieve synergy. And then we can foster development in each other's areas. So that's another area we work on in the future. So for the short-term and medium-term economic development, that's our plan. Now I've listened to members' comments. Some members expressed concern on our financial health. We are financially robust. Now we have more than $122 billion in deficit. That's more than six billion than expected. There are three reasons for that. First, poor market performance. So a drop by $30 billion in stamp duty revenue. And because of the poor market sentiment, there was a drop in the land sale revenue by $40 billion or so. But then last year, we issued more bonds by $31 billion. So that explains the deficit. When you look at our public finances, you should look beyond just the finances for a year or two. As I said in the budget, we are a small economy. We're an open economy. When the major economies 
experience a huge change and they say they sneeze and we experience the shock. We should look at whether we're balancing the books in an entire economic cycle and whether we meet the basic laws requirements. And we are confident we are doing that. In 2023 to 24, that is the upcoming year, after the bond issuances, we will have a $50 billion deficit. And that's a drop from before. If we see better than expected tax revenues, then we will see an even smaller deficit. So when can we start seeing surplus even without bond issuances? That's 2025 or 26, two years from now. But looking at these is not good enough. You may be wondering, just exactly what's the percentage of government expenditure in GDP? This year, 2022 or 23, that's more than 28% government expenditure to GDP. And because of the employment support scheme, fighting COVID, that's more than $140 billion in expenses. But then in the next few years, we will see a shrinking expenditure. That way, the government expenditure to GDP ratio will return to 22% five years from now. Now, what about our revenue? This year, we're doing poorly in terms of revenue because of less land sales, a drop in the stamp duty revenue. So this year, the revenue will make up roughly 21.2% of our GDP. That's 21.4% or so. But five years from now, it will be 23.4% going up. So five years from now, things will be different. In fact, you don't even need a full five years two to three years from now, you start to see revenue making up a greater part of GDP, and then the expenditure making up a smaller part of our GDP, you will see the difference narrowing. And then we will see more revenue than expenses. Now, what about the reserves? As at March this year, $830 billion or so. That's for 12 months of government expenditure. Now, what about five years from now? It will be 980 billion dollars, rough almost a thousand billion dollars. That's roughly 14 months of government expenditure. Now from 2023 to 24, we will be issuing $65 billion in bonds every year. Now we will have all kinds of infrastructure projects. We need to make good use of the market resources. At the same time, we want to preserve our strength. We want to stay financially robust to meet any changes. So we will be issuing $65 billion in bonds every year. But the debt to GDP ratio will be low. This now, debt to GDP ratio at 4.3%. Five years from now, that will be at 9.5%. In a place where people often compare us with, in that city, the debt to GDP ratio is 120 to 130 percent. Now, of course, they have a huge reserves too. So, in managing public finances, we are both we have we have both robust and we have all kinds of options. Now, to respond to some points raised by members, land, housing. For public housing, as Ms. Winnie Hall was saying, and on land, Ms. Bernadette Lean was saying, land and housing are a priority for the government. We will move full steam ahead with the work. For public housing, in the next 10 years, we have found enough land to meet not just the target, but to go beyond the target for housing. It's just uh, building houses takes time and we will need time to form the site. So more units will be will come on stream in the next in the second half than the first half. So we will have light public housing units to meet the gap in between. For private flats in the next three to four years, we will see a hundred and seven thousand units. That's for private flats. This is the highest level since 2012. I'm sorry, I'm starting, I'm counting the figures from 2012 because that's when I joined the government. Now, the completion numbers. 2002, that was 21,000. In the next five years, on average, each year we will see 20,000 units completed. So for private flats, we will be 
meeting our target, and there will be a steady supply of private flats. Mr. Louis Long put this question to me. Under what circumstances will the government adjust the demand side management measures for the home market? We have been watching the market. We don't see a need so far. On the factors we consider, first we consider demand and supply. So we will see 20,000 units to be completed each year. That's an ample level of supply compared with the past. But on demand, there is keen demand for such flats. There is some correction in the home market, but the prices remain on a high level. For mortgage payments, they make up roughly 69.7% of household incomes. That's a very high level. The average number over the past 20 years is roughly 51%. So when we consider whether to adjust the harsh measures, we look at demand and supply, the market conditions, and the prices. For first-hand and second-hand flats, we look at the price difference. The price difference, to a certain extent, shows whether the market is tight. We also consider the overall economy. So in response to Mr. Long's question, that's our thinking. Now, we mentioned spending on social welfare. Ms. Chris Sun mentioned that in detail, so I will not go into that in great detail. I just want to offer a brief summary here. In formulating the budget, we put people first. Over the past five years, 2018 19 to 2023 to 24, just look at these years, the recurrent expenditure of the government. On health and welfare, the rise is 44%. For social welfare, the rise is 52.2%. On education, a rise by 21.6%. So on these key livelihood areas, the recurrent expenditure over the past five years has seen significant increases. And at the same time, over the past five years, for the middle class, We've also adjusted the measures on income taxes. We've made changes to the tax scales, to the bracket. So over the past five years, that was we collected $126 billion less in tax revenues. And at the same time, there was sharp rises in spending on education, social welfare, and health. This shows our values, and that is money should be spent where necessary. There are recent news reports saying that there are fewer income tax forms being sent out. Some people are wondering why. Does that mean we will get less in income tax revenue? So here's an update. Over the past few years, we rolled out tax concessions, say, a 100% refund subject to a cap of $6,000 this year or $10,000 next year. Every time we have such measures, at least 90,000 people will not have to pay taxes. We looked at the figures. This year, we're sending out fewer tax return forms, but there are more taxpayers. Compare this year to last year. Last year, there were, there were roughly 1.4 taxpayers for income tax. This year, we have roughly 1.46 million taxpayers for income tax. And we will get more in income tax. Last year, it was $77 billion. And this year, it will be $83 billion or so. In other words, some wonder if some people have emigrated. Does that mean we will get less in income tax? But then that job has to be filled by someone. And whoever fills that job will pay the taxes. So the in in impact on income tax will be minimal. And let's bear in mind those figures. We will reflect on the figures. With more income tax revenue, more taxpayers, where do they come from? There are fewer tax forms going out, but more taxpayers. So this means COVID has hit the medium to low income classes particularly hard, especially the grassroots. 
So for those who were just made it into the tax bracket or exempted, that's what happened. President, this budget is the first budget of this term government. This is also a budget in a critical year for Hong Kong. We have a clear goal. We want to provide the support people need, and we also focus on the economy pursuing development to drive Hong Kong's economy to go on a fast track of development. With the firm support from our country, with patriots administering Hong Kong fully in place, and we see stability in the community. We will continue to combine a capable government and an efficient market. We will leverage Hong Kong's institu institutional strengths and distinctive functions aligned with national development strategies, integrate into national development, and go full steam ahead in promoting our economic development. President, we also attach importance to this point that we need to make sure that the fruits of our economic development can be shared widely in the community. We want to translate economic development into a better quality of life for people so that people get a sense of gain and happiness. On this regard, we welcome more comments and let's work together. As I said just then, that's for the goals of the budget 2023 to 24. I urge members to support the appropriation bill 2023 so that we can promptly implement the measures under the budget. Thank you. Could you I now put the question to you that the Appropriation Bill 2023 be read the second time. Will those in favour please raise their hands? Those against, please raise their hands. I think the question is agreed by majority of members present. I declare the motion passed. Appropriation Bill 2023. This Council now becomes Committee of the whole Council to consider the Appropriation Bill.